right? So have you ever thought, I wonder what it's like to live in the Matchett House? <laughs> have you ever thought that? Uh, people have kind of even said, so, it must be something in your house. Like, hey, hey, yeah, it's something. <laughs> and and I, I was sitting down yesterday, actually, and I, and I was watching a TV show, and, and uh, I thought, if I could... If I can tell people this TV show, then they'll know what it's like to live in my house. And it, our lives is kind of just summed up in this in this one TV show. And uh, it's an old show now, uh, but you can go on YouTube or or if you can look online, you can find it. And just just watch two or three episodes, and it'll 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 give you an idea of what it's like to live in our house. But the show is called Everybody Loves Raymond. <laughs> And if you look just at Ray and Deborah in the show, that's us. And so you just you just go there. That's just for free today. You just go home and look up Everybody Loves Raymond. Watch a couple episodes of your life, and you'll probably never ever find yourself thinking, "I wish I lived in the Magic House again." Just like that would be too much for me. That was just free. I don't know why I said that, but I did. But we're working our way through a series. I'm not sure how long the series will take, and we've been kind of trying to do speaking earlier in the service and then res some response time after. And we've been working through a series called Strongholds, and we talked about the stronghold of religion and how religion can really hold us back from the relationship that God wants to have with us. We talked about how worship breaks strongholds. We talked about the strongholds of the past. We talked about how our tongue can be a stronghold because our tongue can shape and move our whole life. Last week, Pastor Adam talked about the stronghold of complaining. Pastor Tony, a few weeks ago, talked about the importance of guarding your heart against strongholds. So Pastor Adam talked about the stronghold of complaining. And then after church, they wanted to go for lunch, so we were going to pay some, which is in St. Antoine, which I know how to get to, by the way. And, uh, and so we were, we were on our way there, and he was following me, but he was driving so slow. And he was like, that's so annoying. And so I started to complain about the fact that he was driving too slow. And so Penny's sitting there just, just in quiet like Penny does. And I'm like, I'm like, this is why is why is he driving so slow? This is so annoying. Like, speed up, man. And then she wrote about it on Facebook so the world knew that I was complaining. <laughs> So we're looking at things that hold us back. Have you ever heard somebody say, listen, I know God just wants me to be happy. We've all heard someone say that God just wants me to be happy. I'm not saying God doesn't want us to be happy. But I think that God is more concerned about us being holy than he is with us being happy. Do you know that Holiness and happiness are not the same thing. That you can actually be unhappy but still be holy. That everything can go wrong and you can still live a life that's pleasing to God. Happiness is based on the outward circumstances. It's if you wake up in a good mood or your spouse does or doesn't wake up in a good mood. That'll decide if you're going to be happy that day. If you don't burn your toast, or if your husband doesn't act like Ray Romano, or if you don't stub your toe, how many know that we can let one bad moment ruin a whole day? Because it's based on outside circumstances. You have one person trying to follow you, and they're way behind. That's annoying. The older I get, the more I read about God and His Word, and the more that I learn about Him, the more I'm convinced that God is more concerned with holiness than he is happiness. But we can be unhappy and still be holy. I'm not saying it's easy. But if we just define holiness, holiness means to be set apart, total devotion, or unique. You're looking at me saying, well, you're unique. <laughs> or unique, set apart, different. God is holy. Set apart without sin. And the truth is, he's calling us to be holy. To be set apart without sin. Now turn to your neighbor and say out loud, that sounds hard. 
To be without sin. You're like, that sounds hard. Here's the good news. It's impossible to be perfect. So turn to your neighbor and say, that is great news. So we need to understand that the goal is to be holy, but understanding that we are human. In the 1900s, there was this movement called the Holiness Movement, where the church emphasized holiness. And it was a good thing. It was calling people to holiness, to be set apart. But then this holiness became about rules, and those rules turned into legalism, and that legalism turned into control. And so legalism is when you have to do everything a certain way, like the Pharisees would do in the Bible. We acted like if we, if we just modified our behavior enough, then that would make us holy or set apart. But that's not what makes us holy. See, I say this often, but if you don't smoke, drink, or chew, or hang, people with, hang with people who do, that, that doesn't make you holy. By just modifying your behavior doesn't make you holy. They, they wore long dresses, no makeup, didn't go to movies, they didn't go to bowling alleys. Went to, they thought that if you went to church, it had to be six hours long, and they had to talk a certain way. And they thought, that's what's going to make us holy, but that's not what makes us holy. Often we attend church, and we're all guilty of this to some degree, and we attend church as an add-on to our lives to make us a better person or a better version of ourselves. We think that God wants me to be a better version of me. I think we need to understand, and if you have a pen, you should write this down. God's goal for your life is not to make you a better version of yourself. It is to make you more like His Son. This isn't about me being a better version of me. Because a really good version of me is still wicked above all else. He's not concerned about me being a better version of me. He's concerned about me being like His Son. Being more like Jesus is the goal. This week I went and got gas. How many love paying for gas? No one. Okay, so I went and got gas this week. Went in, got some stuff, went and paid for gas, and the total just did not seem right to me. And I was like, are you sure you've got my cards? It's right there. Yep, you're all paid. And, I mean, I'm not that good at math. But I knew that I had got $45 and some cents of gas. See, because this is how my mind works. If I'm going to buy gas and only gas, I always put it at a zero. But if I'm going to buy other things, they're going to mess up my receipt so that I don't care where I stop with the gas because the other thing's going to make it an odd number. So I just buy $45, whatever gas, and I just, that's what I did. So the lady's like, no, I charged the right amount. So I go out, my receipt was for $45 and some cents, and I go out, and my gas pump said that I pumped $45 and something worth of gas, plus I had all these other things. So I'm not that good at math, but I knew it wasn't right. So I got all of this stuff for free. And I was like, thank you, God. No, I didn't. But that's what I wanted to do. Because who likes paying for gas? So I was like, oh, okay. So I, I put my stuff in the car. Or I brought the stuff in with me, got the, out of the car, brought it back in with me. And I went to the lady. I said, listen, you mischarged me for gas because my pump says $45 and something. And my receipt is only $45, but I have like $15 worth of, of stuff here. And, uh, and she said, oh, I, I made a mistake. <laughs> the other lady that got $30 worth of gas paid $45. But she's gone. And so I was like, oh, she's having a bad day. <laughs> and I was like is, like, is there anything I can do? Can I leave the money here? And, and if she comes back and whatever, she's like, no, she's gone. There's nothing I can do. I can't take your money. I want to be clear. There's been many times in my life where I've not done the right thing. 
But the more that I follow Jesus, the more he shapes me into a likeness of him. Not just a better version of me. Because a better version of Troy takes the gas every time. I mean, you, you can look at me with judgment in your eyes if you want. But a better version of me still doesn't make the right decision. Because I think gas is a ripoff. And it's like 15 years ago, oil was cheaper than it is. And I was I don't want to get it. Because then I'll be complaining. <laughs> See, God's goal for my life is not to make me a better version of myself. It's to make me more like Jesus. And that's the same for you and it's the same for me. There's, the Bible shows us this exact same scenario over and over. And that's what we're going to talk about today. That on our own, on our own, we cannot behave well enough to become holy. And how many said amen? amen. The rest of you should have been really loud there. But we can't just modify our behavior enough because our will is not strong enough. And if it was, we'd all be skinny, we wouldn't have any vices, so there'd be no addiction. If we could just will it to happen. But we look at this through Scripture. Holiness is something that we usually just connect with it being a morally good person, and that's part of it. And we know God is holy because He is perfect. But we need to understand that for us, when we look at Scripture, it's more than that. It's more than just being a morally good person or a better version of ourselves. There's this tension in the Bible when you read it about God's holiness. Especially in the Old Testament. Because if people came into His presence and they weren't pure, it was dangerous and people would actually die. And they didn't die because his presence was, was bad. They died because his presence was so good. Think about that. That he was so holy that sin couldn't stand in his presence. People didn't die because his presence was bad. It died because it was so good. One of the first times we see this tension is about Moses and the burning bush is found in Exodus 3, 1 to 17. A bush is on fire, but it's not being consumed. God tells Moses to take off his shoes because he's standing on holy ground. Moses covers his face in fear. Then God says, do not come any closer. And you can go home and read the story. And it's this intense encounter between the good presence of God and a man that was fearful of his holiness. Then later in Scripture, holiness is talked about or explored deeper. The Bible talks about these temples in Israel where God's holy presence lived. So in that time, God's presence lived in a building. And they had, so at the center of the temple there was a room, and they had a really original name for this room. It was called the Most Holy Place. Very original. And whether you live in, in Israel, or you were a priest, or you're an Israelite, if you went to the temple, you were in danger because you were close to the holiness of God. Because you were close to God's presence, there was danger. Not because it was bad, but because His presence was so good. So this is dealt with in the Bible, is you had to be pure to go into his presence. Not just morally pure, but they had to be ritually pure. So God gave them really clear plan on how to be pure before they went into his presence. What to touch, what to not touch. Don't touch this, don't touch dead things, don't touch that, this, and do not do this or do do this. And then they would enter and this would tell them how to enter the temple to be ritually pure. And that's what the book of Leviticus is about. The second book in the Bible is about laying out how they would go into God's presence and be pure. But it doesn't stop there. Over the next about 600 years, the idea of holiness, the holiness of God keeps 
developing. Then we come to this amazing story written by the, in, in Isaiah by the prophet Isaiah. It's a vision. And I'm going to read it to you, but just to give you a little bit. He's in God's presence in the temple. He knows the rules. He knows he should not be there. He's terrified. He's worried about being destroyed, not because God's presence is bad, but because it's so good. He speaks of a vision of these seraphim, which have six wings, two that cover their face and four other wings. And here's what Isaiah says. In the year the king Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and a train of the robe filled his temple. So he's just retelling what he saw in his vision. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, and the other two they covered their feet, and the other two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the threshold shook, and the temple was filled with smoke, so there was an earthquake. Woe to me, I cried, Isaiah said. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips. And I live among people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord God Almighty. Lord Almighty. So he knows that he feels that he's in trouble because he's in the presence of God. Then one of the seraphim flew to him with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar which he had touched his mouth and said, See, this touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin is atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Who am I? Who shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. So the seraphim takes a coal with a set of tongs, which I'm sure look nothing like this, with a coal, and it flies over and it touches Isaiah on the lips. And something amazing happens is that coal makes Isaiah pure. And something strange it says, your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. So this hot coal makes Isaiah pure. And that is amazing. Because normally, if you touch something impure, it transfers its impurity to you. So if you're eating a hot dog, and you're wearing a white shirt, and you drop ketchup on your shirt, it doesn't make the ketchup go away. It makes your shirt dirty. It's like if I had a white, pure garment, and if you take the coal, it's going to make the garment dirty. And that's how it, it was always happening in the Old Testament. That's why they said, don't touch this, don't touch that, because those dead things will make you not pure when you were in the presence of God. And so that's what's happening. The coal makes Isaiah's dirty lips pure. Because normally if you touch something impure, it transfers its impurity to you. It's like if you were wearing wet gloves and you were to touch the mud. The gloves get dirty. The mud doesn't become clean. And this is why it's so important to monitor the relationships that we have in our life. Because often... The impurity will come into those that are trying to be pure. But when the coal touches Isaiah's lips, the pure coal made Isaiah pure. This is where a switch begins to happen. This is a prophecy of something that's going to happen way later. So for the first time, we have a pure and holy object that transfers purity to something that is not pure. Isaiah is not, if you're going to write something down, write this down. 
Isaiah is not destroyed by God's holiness. He's transformed by it. In that moment, he wasn't prepared. It was a vision, but he was not prepared to be in his presence. And his presence didn't destroy him. His presence transformed him. And that's what we're counting on. You and I are counting on the presence of God transforming us. Because His presence is so good. And this is huge. But this points us to another prophet named Ezekiel. And he had a vision where he's standing in the temple. And he sees water trickling out under the temple. That water turns into a stream, and the stream into a river, and then it begins to throw, flow through the desert. And then all of the desert begins to come to life. And then that river flows into the Dead Sea. And everything in the Dead Sea becomes alive again, and it was dead before. So instead of getting pure before going into the temple, this is showing God's holiness coming out of the temple to make us pure. See, God's holiness is coming out and it brings things to life. Because God's holiness, God's presence makes all things new. That's why it's important and we need to understand that you can gather here before you grow. That you can belong before you believe. Because God's presence changes everything. And so we go through all these things in the Old Testament, and all of a sudden there's this switch where pure things are making things that are sick new. We wonder, what is this all about? And for a long time they didn't know. And then Jesus comes along. He claims that he's fulfilling all of these visions, but in a surprising way. Jesus goes around touching impure people. They have leprosy. They have blood issues. Because remember in Leviticus, the rules were they had to not touch those things or they would become unpure. But Jesus is breaking all the rules. So when he touched them, their impurities should transfer to him. But they don't. Instead, his purity transfers to them. And they become healed. It's like the holy coal in Isaiah's vision telling us of someone else was going to come. That everything was changing. Jesus was the human body of God's holiness. Not a box. Not a temple. Jesus. Jesus and his followers will become new. Will become the new temple. The new hope. And a, they could live their life outside of the temple to bring hope to the world. The Bible also tells us that we are streams of living water. Going back to the prophecy in Ezekiel. See, Jesus fulfilled both Isaiah and Ezekiel's writings. He came to make us holy and to bring life through us. So where do we find ourselves through all of this? It brings us to the very last book of the Bible, Revelation, and another vision of a guy named John, and a final vision of holiness. In this vision, we see the whole world become new. Entire earth becomes God's temple. And Ezekiel's river is there. Covering all creation, taking all the impurities out of the earth, and bringing everything back to life. See, being people of holiness is about having an encounter with a living God. And He will transfer His holiness. We know that it's not about a place, 
a temple. It's about Jesus. I think we need to know that there's no ritual, there's no form that can make us pure. It's an about encounter with a living God. Allowing Him to touch us like a whole and to make us pure, holy, and set apart. You say, Troy, but what does this mean for me today? Here's just some practical thoughts for us. If you're here today and you find yourself going through the form or the ritual, submit your life to Jesus. Commit your life to Him. Every part. Often we find ourselves saying, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll submit my life to Him except for this. i got to hold on to this because this hurts a lot. We need to understand that His holiness will make us pure. And He will ask you and me to walk and to live in that holiness. Peter gives us some advice found in 1 Peter 1, 13 to 16. If you could turn with me there. We're just going to read it together and then I'm just going to bring some things to us today for practical advice. 1 Peter 1, 13 to 16. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you by the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves, also in all of your behavior, because it's written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Peter's quoting from a Leviticus 11.44 to Leviticus 19.2. Just a few things for us, if you have a pen, a paper, or a phone, I'd encourage you to write these down. Number one, prepare your minds for action. If we are going to be people that want to live a pure life, we need to have a new mindset. The Bible says, for so a man thinks, so he is. Prepare your minds for action. Some versions said, gird up, gird up the loins of your mind. You say, what in the world does that mean? In those days, men would wear long gowns. And when they were going to do lots of hard work, they would pull the gown up and they would tuck it into their belt so that they could move quicker, so they could move better, and they could work harder. We need a new mindset. In our culture today, we would, we would say the same thing would be like, let's roll up our sleeves and get to work. So I wouldn't say, all right, everyone, after church, we're going to gird our loins. You'd be like, you gird your own loins, my friend. And you know, like, it wouldn't make sense, right? So it's like, we're... That is not in my notes. I know you'll find that hard to believe. I mean, we're going to roll up our sleeves and we're going to get to work. There is no, at the end of the day, we can have an encounter with the living God. And then we've got to roll up our sleeves and get to work. We need to roll up our sleeves, prepare your mind. Our minds wander unless we prepare and we control them. How many have ever had your mind wander to places you wish it would not wander? Peter says, prepare your minds for action. Number two, keep sober in spirit. We need a new focus, new self-control. The underlying Greek word here, it will be translated wine-less or without wine. And it's not necessarily meaning, it has some connotations about alcohol, but that's not just what it means. It means do not do anything that distracts you or clouds your mind. It doesn't just mean alcohol. It means that we need to be un in, under control at all times. Can anger cloud your mind? Yes. 
Can bitterness and unforgiveness cloud our mind? Yes. Keep a sober spirit. One that is always in focus. <laughs> Stay away from the things that distract you, that cloud your vision. There are some people that you should not be friends with. There are some books that you should not read. There are some TV shows that you should not watch. There are some places you shouldn't go. There are some movies you shouldn't watch. There are some internet sites you should not visit. There are some people you shouldn't date. There are some relationships that are not good for you. There are some jobs you shouldn't have. There are some habits you need to break. There are some songs you shouldn't listen to. There are some people that will only drag you down. But I can't define a list of rules because those rules will, will turn to legalism and then that doesn't work. Because the whole Old Testament is a pops of God putting down rules and man breaking the rules. And then there's new rules and man breaks the rules. I can't give you a list. Because that's not what being holy is. It's about having an encounter with the living God. I can't tell you what books you should or shouldn't read. Or places you should or shouldn't go. Or we'll be in 10 years we'll be saying, can you believe how ridiculous it is that I wasn't allowed to go to the movies? I certainly can't tell you what friends you should avoid or shouldn't hang around with. Because that list will differ from person to person. But the things that bother you and drag you down or cloud your mind from being of sober mind, you need to avoid those things. See, the point is this. You know the truth about the things because the Holy Spirit lives in you. And if you listen to the Spirit, He will give you clear guidance of what you should and shouldn't do. You don't need me to tell you. Just don't. I'm just going to say it. But even the Holy Spirit can't help you if you don't listen to His leading. He says that He will always give you a way out. We just don't take it. Keep your eyes open. Don't let anything cloud your vision. That's Peter's message to us. And then he says this, point number three, fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Basically, we need to have a goal. This is talking about keeping the goal of Christ's return in focus. Because Christ is coming back. The problem is that we trade the temporal or the temporary things. We take those things over the things that are eternal. And we don't keep Christ's return in focus. We just focus on what's in front of us. Yeah, but this will feel good now. But this is what I want today. Christ is coming back. And he'll return for a church that is without spot and wrinkle, it says. What we need to understand is that doesn't mean he's looking for a church like Grace Church that is perfect. Because if that's the case, none of us are going to heaven because someone here is going to screw it up for all of us. <coughs> it means the church, capital C. That means that some from here will make it. Some will not. Because they've traded the eternal for the temporal. Adam and Eve did it. And they tried to cover their sin with something that was temporary that was going to die. See, it's not about what's here in this moment. Fix your hope completely on the grace of Jesus. He will be revealed to you. Number four, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. doesn't mean that you're ignorant. But before you knew. Before you knew better. It's telling us we need a new lifestyle. You can't be holy and live your old life. We need to make a choice. I am Christ and he is mine. Don't slip back to your old way of life. Peter is talking about our outward life, the part that people can see. 
That's what the word conformed means. Back when you didn't know any better, but now you do. Watch how you live. When we adopt the habits, the speech, and the behaviors of the world, we are covering up the true identity of who we are as God's children. Number five. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves, also in all of your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. The truth is we need a new standard, because the problem is we judge ourselves by other people. And so we'll say things like, I don't gossip as much as, or I don't drink as much as, or you know what, I don't, I don't have as much forgiveness as, and we let other people be our standard. Don't compare yourself to others, compare yourself to the original. Do you know that if you work in a bank, which they would never allow me to do because I can't count her. But when you work at a bank, the way they learn to identify fake money is they study the real money. Because when they see the fake money, they'll recognize it right away. We need to use Christ as our standard. He's not trying to make me into a better version of me. He's trying to make me into a be like him. Number six. When we submit our life to a holy God, you need to submit your entire life, every department. And I know that's, that's really hard. It's hard for all of us. The true standard of living, the true model to be copied, is not me. It's God himself. Peter's saying is us as God's children, there ought to be a family resemblance. That if we're God's children, we should actually look like him. You don't have to spend much time in my family, to, or I, I could probably, if you didn't know me, and I was, you know, People, room with a hundred people, you would know my children. They'd be like, those poor kids look just like their dad. Or at least one of them does. Because there's a family resemblance. And if we use others as our point, our standard, we begin to look like them and not like Christ. Peter's saying we're God's children and we need to look like our Father. God says, be like me. Holiness is not a set of rules and regulations. Holiness is about God. In closing. Submission to God, have an encounter with a holy God so His holiness can be transferred to us is not easy. But it's about God when I wake up, God when I shower, God around the breakfast table, God on the way to work, God in the classroom, God in the showroom, God in the office, God in the factory, God at lunchtime, God during the break, God on the way home, God at the supper table, God while, God while watching TV, God while reading my email, God while surfing the internet, God on the telephone, God at bedtime, God when I sleep, God in the morning all over again. God in every detail, every place, every relationship, every word, every thought, every deed, every private moment when no one is watching. God with my friends, God with my enemies, God when I'm happy, God when I'm sad. God in the good times, God in the bad times, God in faith, God in doubts, God when I succeed, and God when I fail. God above me, God below me, God before me, God behind me, God around me, and God within me. See, it's about God always and forever. God needs to be first and last. Under your feet, above your head, God all around you. Guiding all I do and all I say. God in my deepest thoughts, always God. Always there, always with me now and forever. This is holiness. Holiness is when you allow His presence to change you. Without God, the truth is, 
I have no meaning. I have no purpose. I have no reason for even being here. The problem is we treat God like an add-on. And when we treat Him like an add-on, living in holiness is impossible because it's just an act of our will. But when God consumes everything, those acts of our will become much easier. But you need to allow the holiness of God to touch you. Only God can make you pure. There's three things. This is something that I hope that we can all remember. The number one thing that we need to submit to God is our attitude. Because the attitude is the ground in which everything else is planted. And if our attitude is not submitted to a holy God, it's going to be really hard to modify our behavior. A, B, C. We need to give God our attitude. And our attitude and an encounter with God will help our behavior. And our behavior will dictate our choices. But as long as we treat God like, a, like an add-on, living in holiness is impossible. He says, be holy as I am holy. We know that's impossible. But all he's saying is, use me as your measuring stick. Not Troy. Because the farther we get away from the original, the worse the picture gets. It's like if I took a piece of paper and I gave it to you and said, okay, I want you to draw a dog. And then you drew a dog, and, and, and I don't know if you're a good drawer, but it's probably not going to be that good, but you draw a dog. And it's not going to look like the original. And then if Gabby takes your picture, and he looks on your picture, and he draws off your picture, by the time we get over there, it's probably going to like be an elephant or something. Because we get away from the original. Don't compare yourself to other people. As intimidating as it is, compare yourself to Jesus. Have an encounter with a God that transfers His holiness to you. He was doing it all along. But we needed Jesus to show us. So we're going to worship together this morning. If you're here this morning, you say, Try, I need an encounter with God. I need an encounter with the living God. Because what I have going on is not a picture of Jesus. It's a picture of me. Then I would encourage you just to come to the front. If you feel comfortable, just raise your hands in the air. Say, God, I need you today. Touch my lips. Make me pure. Because many of us, us in this room, we've tried to do it on our own for a long time. So why don't you stand? And as we begin to worship together, I would really encourage you, if you need an encounter with the living God, I encourage you to come today. Let us pray for you.